Well, a lot of people have paid tribute to Mbonge Ngema as South Africa's finest producer, composer and lyricist of our time. The 68-year-old acclaimed play playwright uh, passed away last night after a head-on crash with a truck near Bizana in the Eastern Cape as he was uh, returning from a funeral after attending that funeral. He is widely known as uh, the brains behind the 1988 play Sarafina. In the 90s, it was adapted for the silver screen featuring Whoopi Goldberg. How much of an indelible mark on South Africa's journey to freedom and the arts industry has Mbongeni Ngema left? We discussed that. We are now joined by renowned producer Duman Dlovu, who has actually uh, worked with Mbongeni Ngema. Uh, Babun Dlovu, good afternoon, good morning, and thank you so much for making time for us. Good afternoon, uh, Adrian, and all the viewers uh, of the SABC News. And condolences to you as well. So it is 1984, you are in the US, and Waza Albert comes to the US. Tell us about that story. Uh, I went to this small theater in the village to go and see this play. And on stage, there were these two South Africans who just exploded and took me back home. I was in exile. I hadn't been home in a long time. And I cried as I watched the energy. But the sad part for me was that the theater was almost empty. And at that time, I was producing in Harlem. Uh, I was running a small theater with uh, voters. Uh, and I spoke to Mbongeni and Percy to take them up to Harlem uh, so that there could be a wider audience for them. And the rest, as they say, is history. The rest is history. Was that the first time that you would have met um, Mbongeni Ngema or would you have worked with him before? No, no, I met him. Uh, I had met him a few months before when they were planning to come uh, to stage the play. And then I met him. Uh, this now was the first time we spoke and we sat down and we started a relationship. And that relationship was to last uh, uh, the lifetime. Yeah. And uh, Adrian, I think it is safe to say he is responsible for my so-called success as much as I was uh, responsible for his success because I then introduced him into a wide uh, population of Americans and the work that we did together just uh, transformed not only the United States, but it also opened the path for South African culture all over the world. Mm. Started with Rosa Albert, came with Asina Mali, and of course the phenomenal Sarafina. Yeah. And what was your first impressions then of him when you guys were having this meeting um, as Rosa Albert was coming to the US and now finally getting the opportunity to then sit down with him physically and then having to work with him? What was your impression of his work ethic? The, the, the strange thing, the, first of all, let me talk on the personal level. The strange thing, our meeting with Mbongeni, we sounded like old friends who've known each other in, all each other's lives. I was just a year older than him, so we're almost the same age. We had the same energy, we had the same passion, we had the same zeal. His work ethic was just on another level, and it could be reflected in the energy of the play. And I just knew that if black Americans were to see the work, they would fall in love immediately with the, with the play. Um, so together we worked to introduce first his theater and then eventually South African black theater to America. And the success, how people responded to it, also had a lot to, to do with how we just threw ourselves into the thing. I think I had found my mission also in exile. I found the thing that would make exile more worthy for me by meeting Mbongeni and working with him on his theater. Mm -hmm. And speak to us then about that particular experience because it's also during the height of, um, of apartheid and also back home at least, there was an escalation around the resistance. But then living in the US and also trying to promote what was referred to at the time, I guess, as, um, as African art coming from South Africa, but it's coming from a South Africa which at the time was very polarized and to some extent also um, very fatal for black people specifically. So I always regard, uh, uh, describe myself as a cultural nationalist. 
In South Africa, I went into exile because of my activities within the Black Consciousness Movement. I was very much involved in the politics of the country and worked under the organization that Stephen Biko has started. But when I got to the United States, one got an opportunity to use the arts to escalate our activism. There was, a, 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 there was an opening there. Uh, there was a gap that one could easily fill. Uh, Americans were hungry for South African art and they were ready to support the South African struggle. In the work that we did with Ngema, we found a compatible way of fighting for our liberation using art and theater. In him, there was a fearless soldier, somebody who was not afraid to stand up and call uh, South Africa's bluff. All his works stood up on stage and called for the end of apartheid and actually said, freedom is coming tomorrow. So it became easier for us to tell our story through the arts. A moment for me to be able to pursue my work in exile by pushing the South African arts. Yeah, actually earlier this year, I was sharing with our viewers, um, in May, I spoke to him and interviewed him about the decision that has been taken by the Keynes Festival, a uh, Keynes Festival to have uh, Sarafina being um, screened again, which was the first movie um, at the Keynes Festival from South Africa to be selected twice uh, to be screened. And he also speaks then about the experience that you've touched on now, specifically when it comes to Sarafina, how the audience would respond to Sarafina. And he says that sometimes you'd find that the audience would leave crying in tears because of what they were witnessing on the stage. The, the first performance was September 10. I think it was 1987, you know, with age you get to mix the dates. It was in a small 300 seat theater at the meeting your house. I had given Mongeni $50,000 to go and start a play. He disappeared for a year and he showed up with Sarafina. The opening night, September 10, I would never forget that day. As the kids were singing on stage, the entire theater was in tears. I mean, there's a scene that goes on before intermission. And by the time we went to intermission, there were no tissues in the theater. In those days, the handkerchiefs were still big. Everybody was crying. It was just an emotional experience. Unfortunately, the play had been sold. The three months run had been sold even before the kids arrived there. So people who had not bought the tickets could not see it. And that's when Lincoln Center Theater, which I had worked, I had been working with, we made a decision to extend it to Broadway for a 10 week run. And again, it opened on the 19th of February for a 10 week run. But box office opened up sales and in two days, the tickets were sold up until June, way beyond the 10 weeks that we were talking about. And of course, the rest is history. Yeah, and, and, and now though, when you watch the Sarafina play, I don't know if you, if, if you still go to, um, to some of the um, screenings as well, at least when it comes to the film itself, but then on theater as well, when they have a rerun of Sarafina, what happens to you specifically in those moments? So, uh, Adrian, there, there is nostalgia. We can't take that away from us. But uh, to then be realistic as a, a critic and as a theater person, I always find things that we could have done better. I always find things that he can could have done better. Mbongeni was very passionate about people that he developed and sometimes he br brought some of the older actors into the play then at the conversation we had, I was then Gemma, move away from the grandmothers and the grandfathers, just use young people only and we laughed about it. So the, the, it's a mixture of nostalgia and also just that critical eye to see what is it in this uh, phenomenon that has made it survive all these decades because also as a creator i need to learn from what the viewers and, and, and the audiences want so that my work can also get better on my own on, yeah. on that scale and, and and just in closing when it comes to um critique that he would receive how would he process that and i want to take you back also to um very controversial song um, singing about indians and how indians were treating black people in durban and of course that song was later then banned um, from being aired and also the song being 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 played on uh, on national radio platforms and, and so forth. 
Did you ever have a conversation about him about that specific moment or any other critical moment where he received criticism? So let me separate, let me quickly try to answer the two questions because I think they are different. So Mbongeni as a theatre icon believed in what is called the third act. And I'm one of those people in their early, in his early works, in fact, in almost all his early plays, he would call me as the third eye to come and sit and critique and give him notes. He would take some of the notes that made sense and some he would cast away. And that's what we as theatre directors do. We listen to notes and when we think a note is crucial and makes sense, we implement it. So in that regard, he was a great and he used to take notes. And there was an unfortunate period for Ungema because it the politics of South Africa and particularly Durban. And it happened at a time when the relationship between the ANC particularly and the Indian community was bit was beginning to be fragmented. And the cheek and also take whatever is relevant to the song uh, for whatever community was talking about to address itself. I just think that there was that hula baloo that just criticized and the baby was thrown away with the bath water. By the time we spoke Menanae, just like in Sarafina 2 as well, it was for me to do mop-up operations and try to bring in my marketing expertise to just uh, try and save the baby. Uh, and trying to see how we can turn the public perception around. And I did do a few things with him where we tried to salvage the situation, so to speak. Yeah. We never spoke about the song and its content per se. We were talking about the fallout, the media fallout and the PR nightmare that came out after that. Yeah. And what was his explanation of Sarafina too um, when you had that conversation with him? Look, Sarafina too, I've always maintained, and, and it gave me an opportunity to organize black journalists, and that was a for, formation of uh, the Forum of Black Journalists. Sarafina too, Mbongeni didn't do anything wrong. He was an artist who was asked to perform or to produce work, and he did. Then the government came in with the funding. So there was, it, 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 you couldn't fault him for producing the work. You needed to see the process that was used and you needed, if you wanted to get involved in all of that, it was the government's processes that were being called into question, not the work that he was doing. Look, all of us as artists, sometimes we do want to become producers because there's this feeling that there's more money in being producers. And I think his mistake then was also to take on the role of a producer. My relationship is something year old relationship. He's always not. Okay. Act, I'm not a singer, I'm a... All right, apologies for that. Uh, we seem to have lost the connection there to uh, Duman Lovu. Of course, you can also drop us an X at the agenda underscore SABC and tell us how you were to be uh, remembering Mbong and Ngema. As you just heard, they're also touching on the controversial issue of 1996 in relation to Sarafina 2, where um, the public protector actually back then had found um, that, that not due processes were followed in the allocation of that money that was given to the production team of Sarafina 2. And of course, um, of course, um, you have um, Bongeningemo who was working on that, as Duma has just indicated now.